had brought nine people to church in my five-seat car. You know, I got out of the car, then two dudes got out of the front seat. He was getting excited. Then five other people got out of the back seat. <laughs> and Pastor Parker's like, dude, what the heck? You know? And then all of a sudden he's like, where's Tatiana at? I was like, oh, I forgot. I went over and unlocked the trunk and she popped out like Jack in the Box. Hey, Pastor, you know? <laughs> and man, his face turned red. He's like, Wacker, don't you ever put your sister in the trunk again. And I was like, oh. he told me either you stop going to church or get out of my house. You're not my son anymore. And uh, he, in a moment's time, put an ultimatum on me. And um, my mom was there. She's, uh, she has multiple sclerosis. She's in a wheelchair. She's very frail. She was weeping. My sister Tatiana was, was just crying, like yelling, Dad, what are you doing? And he put me on the spot. He said, you either leave right now or you say goodbye to that church. And so I had to take a stand with my unsafe family. And I actually left the house that day. And I believe there's going to be a group of young, young folks who want to serve God and they're not gonna push back and try to lower the standard. They're gonna say, we're gonna embrace the standard and we're gonna take it to the next level because we're gonna be more radical. We're gonna be more powerful. We're gonna be more bold. We're gonna reach more nations. I mean, we're gonna have to start reaching some closed nations and we're gonna need some radical and I think God's gonna raise them up. We're here with Pastor Jeremiah Wacker, evangelist, international speaker, uh, and also self-proclaimed church kid growing up in church <laughs> as a youth. Um, many of y'all know him, and we're honored to have him here. Don't forget to comment, subscribe, give us topic ideas, something you'd like to hear, something you'd like to, uh, for us to talk about. Um, yeah, and so today we're excited. Good to have you, Pastor. Yeah, I appreciate y'all having me on. Good to see you. It's a privilege. Yeah. Awesome. Take advantage of you being here. Yeah, You're traveled that. around the world, so... Yeah, God's been good to us. <laughs> so it's good to be a part of something bigger than yourself. And just uh, McAllen Church is a great inspiration to many of us. And so it's just uh, always uh, very exciting to kind of work with y'all on, on anything, you know. So good to be here, man. Awesome, awesome. Yes, sir. So you're from your mother church, your originating church is Austin, Texas. Right, yes. Who was Austin, your Texas. pastor? Who was... So I was, um, I personally was not raised in a Christian home. I'm a semi-church kid because I came in, I got saved when I was 16, but my parents were backsliders from, uh, from an Assembly of God church. They had uh, been saved. They had served God. They had actually answered an altar call to be a, uh, missionaries. Uh, so my parents were church kids, and they had a call on their lives, but they fell into immorality. They, um, had problems with the with you know their parents they had problems with the leadership in the church and they left and they they said we're going to leave and then we'll come back we'll raise our kids in church but they started dabbling in other religions other philosophies and by the time I was born they were full on in the new age so I was raised being taught not to trust the bible that Jesus was just a good guy and a teacher um I'm taught that there's no devil you know, that we don't have sin, just ignorance. So, you know, I was raised with some uh, really uh, anti-biblical philosophies, and, and I had embraced that. You know, I was very opinionated, and, and I believed that. I was a part of a cult called the Unity School of Love, and so, you know, I was a part <laughs> of that youth group. I was, you know, uh, learned about all that stuff. But then when I was 16 years old, I left Austin, Texas, and went to Colorado, and I was living with my grandparents for ninth and 10th grade. And that first year, I gave them a lot of trouble, extremely prideful, very, very sinful and um, full of myself kind of guy, you know, and um, they were, their answer was not necessarily preaching. They never sat me down and explained the gospel, but they thought if we could get them into a church, then, then Jeremiah will, you know, join a church. He'll become a church guy, you know? So um, that was their approach. And sure enough, I made friends at a few different youth groups in Colorado Springs in my ninth grade year. And I actually was a part of one youth group at a church, never heard about being saved, never heard about being born again. And I was, you know, not saved, but a part of that youth group. And those kids were doing the same thing I was doing. So it's like no reference point for conversion, being saved. But then I went to a church 
uh, in Colorado Springs, September of 93. So it's actually 30 years that I've been saved this month. Wow. And uh, I don't remember the day or, you know, uh, exactly how it all went down. But my second or third time going to that church, I lifted my hand. I went to an altar. At the age of 16 years old, I got saved. I got radically saved. And so I lived one year in Colorado serving God in my grandparents' house. My sister Tatiana got saved nine months after that. And um, then God spoke to us to to move back with our parents. And uh, it was one of the first times that I really heard God's voice in a very clear and powerful way for me personally. And uh, we moved, went to an Assembly of God church in Austin, but uh, it just, it, it wasn't really clicking with us. I had met Artie Aragon and uh, became uh, acquainted with the fellowship because of him. And I called him and said, hey, is there a uh, church like yours in Austin? And he gave me a phone number, 339-1729. And I uh, called wow. up Barry Parker and uh, the rest is history, man. So That was when you were 16? I had just turned 17 at that time. My sister Tatiana was 15, yep. Wow. Incredible. So long, so long ago. <laughs> and so how was, how was the church there when you got there, when you got to Pastor Parker's church? When we got to the Austin church, um, you know, uh, he had been there four years. That was 1994. He had been there for about four years. And um, there was about 10, 12 people there. So we went from a church in Colorado that was, you know, over 1,000 people, 100 kids in the youth group, you know. And um, then we go to this church. There's only 10 people. There's no teenager. Yeah. So uh, we served God in that church, and it went from that 10 or 12 people. And, um, and then in about 96, it was running in the 30s. And uh, by 96, there was like two other young people. They were in their 20s, but at least we had rolling buddies. So that, for that period of time, it was about two and a half years that we were the only teenagers in the church. So that, that was pretty intense. That was... Some very lonely times, difficult, but we were working out our salvation, and we uh, were full on for the for the vision. We we love what God was doing. So, uh, real quick, let me ask you, Pastor. Uh, during that time that it was just you and your sister in in the church, did you ever feel like leaving? Did you ever feel like let me look for something else? Let me join another youth group uh, outside yeah. of this church. Did you ever feel anything like that? Yeah, you know. If, if it was a fleeting thought, me or my sister did not give any platform to that voice. And I don't know what it was, but, um, well, actually, I do know what it was. You know, there was a time where my dad was being very aggressive to try to get us out of church. So your parents weren't saved? So my parents did not. Yeah, yeah they were they, not saved. They were not accepted of this whole moving back and going. 100%. Yeah. So they, they brought us, we, we moved back in. And my dad in the beginning was trying to be very subtle. And I'll get back to that, that question about, like, are we going to go somewhere else to, you know, because we were lonely. We were struggling. Like, man, this is a difficult atmosphere to release our, we didn't feel like we had a channel sometimes for all the energy and passion that we had, you know. And we also weren't seeing results. So that, that impatience did. But we never considered leaving. And so. I got to get back to that. But my, my dad started off being subtle. When I first went to visit him after being saved four months before I actually moved back, first thing he did when I got off this, uh, the Greyhound bus was to give me a joint. <laughs> and at that point, I didn't know that smoking weed was wrong. So I was like, oh, thanks, Dad. And he's like, yeah, God bless you. And he gave it to me, you know. And so <laughs> he knew that I was in church. And it wasn't aggressive. It was totally chill. and. Um, you know, just part of the way that I was raised, my dad was like my best friend. I was a really weird ninth grader picture of my dad in my locker. Like, that's my buddy. That's my dude, you know? And so I, I don't know. That was just our relationship. So when I went to see him, I'd been saved four months and a lot of stuff went down. I basically backslid for that two week period. Um, but now let's fast forward and we move back and he's trying to be subtle and Give you more cigarettes. Uh, like he off the weed, you know, he knew that that was off limits because I got filled with the Holy Ghost in March of 94. And that was my no turning in Colorado, moment, in Colorado, in Colorado. Yeah. And, uh, their clarity 
dropped on me, like from January to March of 94, while I was pursuing the baptism of the Holy Spirit, like God was dealing with me. So when I got, when my sister and I moved back, he knew there was no weed, there was no drinking, there was no partying. It, we are not, there's no more girls, you know, he would let girls stay the night at our house and just dumb stuff, you know, um, the way that they were parenting without biblical standards, uh, just messing us up. But um, the subtle attacks phased out of gross sin to, hey, we're going to have family, family night this, this week. And me and my sister were like, praise God, we want our family to, you know, and then Friday afternoon, you know, I'd get home from school like, hey, where are we going to do family night? Oh, yeah, we're going to have a dinner, uh, family dinner Sunday at 6 p.m., 6.30. Me and Tatiana are like, pops, come on, dad, we're going to be at church. Oh, what, you're going you're gonna, to uh, reject your family for the church? Oh, wow. Dad, you know that church is Sunday night. Why would you even do that? There's like 168 hours in a week, and that's when you want to. So that was subtle, but it didn't work. Yeah. And so there was this Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde thing that happened to my dad where he went from being subtle to just being full on. He would come into our room like at two or three in the morning and kick the door open, flip on the lights, wake us up and just start cursing us. You're being brainwashed. You're in a cult. Uh, there is no Jesus. The, and he'd just be like horrible things, Wicked, cussing yeah. and all that. So, um, so this is to our decision, like, understanding that the will of God has an address yeah. type of thing is that uh, it came down to it where God spoke to me and my sister and said, I want you at the door. So it was like God spoke to us that this is your local church. This is your pastor. And when God spoke that to us, it was no turning back. We just said yes. And then the lonely times came. The, the people in the church were fantastic people. I honored them a thousand percent but they were married they had kids they had jobs and we were just two teenagers that just wanted to fellowship every night and go outreaching it you know 10 times a week and stuff like that so they just couldn't facilitate that and even pastor parker um one of the most amazing you know soldiers for for the faith he was raising a family of five working a uh, third shift as an er nurse at the hospital. Dang. 10, 12 hours a night, you know, and, and then pastoring a church. So he, in those first couple of years was like, he was pouring out every ounce of his life to get that church moving forward. Means he didn't have a lot of time to go fellowship or call an outreach on Monday night or yeah. whatever, you know? Yeah. So the lonely times came, nobody's fault. Just that's where we were. That's where God put us. And it was never an option. Leaving was not an option. Yeah. And that, that saved us from a lot of wasted energy, you know? Well, I think it's different than what some other teenagers might go through. That They might be in the same circumstance, feeling like they're the only youth, but they're quote-unquote forced because their parents are there. Yeah. But at least for you and your sister, your parents weren't there, and you made the decision, like, I'm staying here even if I'm lonely. Yeah. So that, that's like a, like, I commend you for that because you, you technically had the choice, and there's people who are like, I guess in my demographic, who their parents are there and maybe they do feel lonely and they don't have the choice, but it was a lot different for you and your yeah. sister. Yeah, and I would say to those, those whether you're a church kid or a new convert or a pastor's kid, man, God wants to speak to you. Yeah. Like Samuel was 11 or 12 years old and God spoke to him, called him by name. Yeah. And so if the, for the pastor's kids that like had to leave all their friends, yeah. go to another city. Listen, the will of God has an address. You're not just, uh, you know, a side dish on the main. No, no, no. You are part of the main team. You are a part of God's will for your parents calling for that city. And psh, man, I, I honestly believe that if a pastor's kid, maybe they're facing some of those things or uh, anybody who's a part of a church that's in a smaller church and struggling with that. Like all my friends are in the bigger churches and stuff like that. It's a lot more connected because of Instagram and some of these other yeah. things. So some, a kid in a church of 12 people now gets to see everything the church of 300 people yeah. is doing. And I, I, bet that takes, <laughs> I bet that's a little bit harder on them, though. 100%. To, to be the, the church with 12 people. 
Yeah. You can see the church an hour away with 300 having a blast. Yeah, now they watch. And I remember fantasizing like, man, if I was in the San Antonio church. Yeah, I was about to bring that up. With Chris Todd and with Miguel. Yeah. Those dudes were going street preaching every night, you know? And those relationships actually saved me. You yeah. know, Roderick Gonzalez, Chris Todd, uh, Miguel, Pastor Roman, you know, the, these folks, those relationships preserved us. Roger Gamboa, you know, Moses Aguilar, these guys being able to just cruise over to San Antonio and, and do stuff with them. But one word from God, I believe, can change everything. Yes. So a pastor's kid that's like, man, I have a calling. I have a reason. And we were very intentional when we went to India. So when I was a pastor and I had my teenage kids with me, I was like, y'all are a part of this vision. Y'all are a part of this. So I know I'm kind of leapfrogging, you know, 20 years ahead. But just I think Jordan and Joshua both understood in India that they were part of the calling, that they weren't just there because you know on accident yeah you didn't drag them along yeah no no they're they're part of the team man i need you you're you're here god's gonna use you you know so um that kind of all goes to some of the convictions that we formed tatiana and i both in those early days yeah no that's powerful that's uh it's not something that we i've ever heard addressed you know we just tell people to stick it out, but the reality is there's a lot of small churches in our fellowship. Yes. There's a lot of young people who um, are in small churches or their pastors are, their parents are pastors of small churches and yeah. they can just feel like they're doing time till they're, I'm just yeah. here till like, till I'm done, you know? Like, they listen. might even say like, um, they might not even necessarily backslide, but like when I turn 18, I'm going back to my mother's church. Like right. it's at least it's better over there, but. You're saying like if you stick it out there, like you can be, you can be the difference, cause and like switch up the church setting. Yeah. Like that teenager who feels like that they have no friends in that church, even if they are saved, like they can be, they could be that game changer for yeah. the church. Yeah, and you know I get mocked for this, but I do have one like simple answer that I think solves every problem, and uh, not everybody, you know, they're like, dude, you're too simplistic, but. If you become a passionate soul winner, then like it solves like 98% of the problems. <laughs> yeah. So like me and Tatiana, we were lonely. We'd go outreach. Yeah. You're chopping it up with some drunk dude on 6th Street. And it's like, <laughs> you don't worry about your problems anymore. You know, <laughs> you know, uh, we had to take some major stands at high school. You know, I left eighth grade, uh, ninth and 10th grade. I was gone in Colorado. I got saved during that time. Then I go back and I see all my old peers. I gave a flyer to one girl. And uh, this is uh, 11th grade, Austin High School. And she said, I went to junior high with a kid named Jeremiah Wacker. I was like, I know, I remember you. And she said, you are not him. <laughs> she said, you are a different person. <laughs> that was a powerful moment for me. But, that was, but we were so ad addicted. We were so focused on soul winning. You know what I mean? That it's like. That solves so much. Yeah. So if you're in a small church, you feel lonely, or like if you have a passion, like we prayed, my sister and I started fasting every Wednesday back in 1994, asking God to speak to us. Do you want us at the Assembly of God Church or at the door? So we did that for two months and then God spoke to us, like, I want you at the door. It's very powerful. God spoke to me, spoke to her at different times, said the same thing. So it was very powerful. And we never turned back, but we, kept fasting on Wednesdays. We kept that. And we still do that, you know, since uh, 1994. We still do that. But the per it went from God speak to us where to go to give us revival. Yeah. We would fast on Wednesdays and we would follow up with all of the people at school saying, hey, you want to come to church tonight? And our fasting was directly focused at filling up the first two rows with teenagers at our church in Austin. So like in my mind, and I know not everybody does, thinks that's too simple. You don't understand my problems, but I really believe it solves like 98% of the problems. Like wherever you're at, like God speak to me and then use me and boom, you're on mission. Yeah, well, <laughs> so uh, obviously the, the Austin church now is, is very, very thriving church. It's, it's, yeah. it's made impact the, uh, Pastor Barry Parker's legacy that he's left there, yeah. his testimony of sticking it out through that time. 
So you were there through the whole revival. How, how was that, or what yeah. part did you play in that? Well, God used my sister and I as a, as a piece of the puzzle. Uh, the Austin Church is such a powerful testimony because you have Pastor Parker, then you have those early converts, and uh, they were stable, they were families, they, they were dedicated. Then me and my sister came, and we caused a lot of trouble. I regret the headaches that I gave Pastor Parker, but... <laughs> You know, we are kind of like the Peters of the church. You know, we wanted to get out of the boat and walk on water, but we were sinking all the time, you know, and ah, I can't save me, you know. So, but, um, and then God did use us. I mean, I was, a, made a strange, strange decision for a 19-year-old. I went and uh, got rid of my Hyundai Excel sedan, and I got into a Chevy Astro van. It was like a soccer mom card for a 19-year-old, you know. I was like, <laughs> what are you doing? Well. Pastor Parker had rebuked me because I had brought nine people to church in my five-seat car. You know, I got out of the car. Then two dudes got out of the front seat. He was getting excited. Then five other people got out of the back seat. <laughs> and Pastor Parker's like, dude, what the heck? You know? And then all of a sudden he's like, where's Tatiana at? I like, oh, I forgot. I went over and unlocked the trunk. And she popped out like Jack in the Box. Hey, you know, <laughs> and man, his face turned red. He's like, Wacker, don't you ever put your sister in the trunk again. And I was like, oh, okay. So I went and uh, so I went and then I got a van, you know? And so that was kind of the role. We were just always evangelizing pocket flyers in our pockets everywhere we went. And we would, we pulled over one time on our way to a fellowship. And so this is kind of like our role was just doing radical things, you know, for God. And so we were on our way to a fellowship. There was a carnival at the Walmart parking lot. We pulled over and we just started preaching. We started witnessing. There were four of us at that time. And we had no idea that we were standing in between two gangs that were about to shoot each other. So two of us went to one gang. The other two went to the other gang. And we're just preaching to them. One of those kids got saved. And we... One guy told me that that witness broke up that fight. They, they dispersed. So I was kind of crazy. Wow. But that guy that got saved ended up being responsible in 2005 when our church was hitting like 250. You know, in Austin, I was assisting. And we sat down like, how many people are in church because of Mayo? Mayo's serving God today. He's one of the youth assistants. But he got saved back there in uh, 97. And in 2005, we counted over 105 people who had been in church because of him. Wow. So that's kind of part, you know, and I put a lot in just that one statement, but we got to watch the church go from 10 or 12 people, 97 were running 35 people. And in July of 97, a revival with less obtain, we had over 80 people. So we had more than doubled in that time frame, And um, some of those were people that we had witnessed to, you know. So we would just go anywhere we could to witness and evangelize. And, you know, some advice that I would give to a church kid or how are you going to serve God in 2023? You know, be radical. Like embrace the vision for being a soul winner. And I just really believe that if you become passionate about that, then, man, once you get on mission, you're like, let's do this. Yeah. And it's something that everybody can do. It's something that, you know, you don't have to go to school for. You don't have to be, you know, learn, learn it. You don't have to. Yeah. Anybody can soul win because we all have a testimony. Yeah. Yeah. I have a saying where uh, grace abound, where sin abounds, grace abounds the more. And I've adapted that for the, uh, for the youth of today. Where shyness abounds, the grace of God abounds the more. Wow. So you can be an introvert and be on fire for God. Yeah. You can struggle with social awkwardness you know anxiety and you can be a flaming on fire soul winner god's grace man will empower you so yeah it's not a personality uh issue, issue yeah. it's not a, a talent issue yeah so no that's right, awesome yeah. pasha i got a question for you yeah um because you came in at such a young age and you you know you've stuck it out you've been a pastor you pioneered you've been a missionary now evangelizing uh, your family's in church 
Is there any decisions, any stands, anything that you can go back to? Because, you know, as as youth, we always hear about um, things that we should do. Hey, uh, don't do this, don't do that, or make this stand now. And and we hear these, you know, I guess rules, regulations. Right. But what are the effects? What are the rewards of of keeping ourselves all those years? Is there anything that comes to yeah. your mind that you were able to to do when you were young that you're reaping the benefit of now? Yeah, so part of, like, because you did mention standards or convictions, you know, which I believe are extremely important. I believe you have to have, if you are born again, if you're saved, then you have to develop convictions. And those convictions are uh, expressed through standards or putting boundaries, you know, in your life. So, to answer your question, one of the things that I, I've complicated my life in a multitude of ways, but one of the ways I simplify my life and that I'm reaping the rewards now is that I embraced the convictions and the standards that my pastor gave me, you know, and uh, I asked questions later. I said, I just want to be right. I did want to know the why, but I was like, yeah, I see it in my pastor. I can do what he does because I want what he has. And then I learned. So that was one of the decisions and stands I made. The other uh, thing that I had to do is when my dad did start getting aggressive is it did get to the point where he, um, he told me either you stop going to church or get out of my house. You're not my son anymore. And uh, he, in a moment's time, put an ultimatum on me. And um, my mom was there. She's, um, she has multiple sclerosis. She's in a wheelchair. She's very frail. She was weeping. My sister Tatiana was, was just crying, like yelling, Dad, what are you doing? And he put me on the spot. He said, you either leave right now or you say goodbye to that church. And so I had to take a stand with my unsaved family. And I actually left the house that day. He didn't even let me take my clothes. My uh, sister had to put some underwear and some clothes in a H-E-B bag and hide it in the, in the bush so I could come back later and get it. You know, it was just, it was intense. But we had to, like, we were going to serve God no matter what. You know, that was kind of our, our motto. When all that was going down, then my dad started giving his narrative to our saved family. So here are Christian people, good people, the grandma and the aunt that led me to Christ. And now they're flipping out. They're saying, you're too radical. You don't need to go to church three times a week. Why don't you just accommodate your dad? And uh, they actually at one point in time said that we were in a cult. Coming from my dad, he would just use any kind of language. You know, he, he just would throw bombs and it just, you know, sometimes they lost their meaning. Yeah. But coming from my safe family, man, me and Tatiana were like, dude, that is. That's painful. Like they didn't, they didn't come and visit my grandpa. He didn't take the role as the patriarch. You know, my convictions about masculinity and male leadership. And were leadership. these the people, the grandparents from Colorado? Yeah, the ones that got me, that prayed with me, took me to church to get saved. And now they are, they took my dad's narrative. And so that was painful. So yeah. you're asking me like, where do I get the benefits? The same aunt that told me I was in a cult, uh, six, seven years later, got one of my tapes. I don't know if you've ever heard of a tape before, but there are these like <laughs> rectangle things. that. And so she got one of my sermon tapes, and she told me that she listened to it every day for a year and a half till Dang. it broke. So that same aunt who said I was in a cult joined the six cult. years later, you know, honored. Yeah, yeah. she didn't quite join. Yeah. But, and she still tells me, Jeremiah, you are a little too radical for my taste, but I honor <laughs> what you're doing. Wow. You know, and so that's what it was. You know, it, it, uh, we were rejected and criticized, but we held our ground. And later on, we were honored and respected. So that was a very powerful moment. And then the other thing that we had to take a stand with was at school. We, uh, we were going to high school, Austin High. Um, we got on the tables and we would preach at lunchtime. The first time I did it, it was so awkward because I finished and I didn't know how. I didn't think about a closer. Didn't think about what to do. So I had to get off the table and walk past everybody while they're just looking at me like, dude, what just happened? The second time I got uh, pulled off by the rent-a-cop. 
and I got a standing ovation. <laughs> so the preacher got arrested and that was the uh, most exciting thing that happened that day at school. But um, yeah, so those are stands that we had to take in different areas of life. The hostility. Oh, I said it all wrong. <laughs> hostility, literally. <laughs> Hostility. Hostility. Yeah, there you go. Yeah. <laughs> One of those words. <laughs> so what, what would you, you growing up in that environment and, and making it, how yeah. can you compare that or what, what differences would you see or say that you see? Because you raised teenagers. Now yeah. they're, how old is, is Josh? Yeah, so Jeremiah's 23, Jordan's 21, Josh is 19. 19, yeah, so you so. just came out of that. What? What differences yeah. would you say they had growing up versus you? Or how, how can you compare the two? Yeah. So Jeremiah was one years old when we got sent out. And then Jordan and Josh were both born in our pioneer work. Wow. So their story is diametrically opposite from me or my wife, Geneva. And so... Our aim the entire time raising our kids was for the will of God. That was our passion for ourselves and for our kids. Yeah. So it's kind of funny because I would always tell my kids, I want you marriage ready by age 17 <laughs> because we were all about the will of God. We were all about, you know, so we did anything and everything we could to facilitate them. And my, my wife was like, what do you mean marriage? Are you trying to make them get married? No, they don't have to at a particular time, but I want them to be ready mentally, emotionally, spiritually, financially to that's our goal. That's our aim. So one of the biggest differences was like with my saved grandparents, they loved God, they loved us, but they had no concept of laying your life down for the will of God. They were just good Christian people. Yeah. You know, then my parents that were not saved, they were opposing us so it's totally different as we raised our kids because we wanted nothing more than the will of god like you were already paving the way for them yes yeah yeah 100 percent. and that's we wanted to impart that into them you know even when we went to india and uh, jeremiah was 18 and he was going to stay behind it was emotionally traumatic for geneva but it, she, she didn't wrestle with the decision. It's the will of God. Yeah. You know, this, we want, he's going to be a disciple. He's going to get married. He's going to be a part of the Austin church. And we knew that was God's will for him. And as painful as it was, it was in God's hands. Not my will, but your yeah. will be done. So that was one of the distinctives, you know? Yeah. That's uh, different, different battles, right? That you had to face that your, your kids wouldn't. And yeah. in the same token, some battles they would have that you yeah. didn't have to have or, or haven't had to have, right? Right. Like the pressures of ministry, the pressures of being in a you know, church right. environment, stuff like that, right? But, and the other struggle that church kids have is they have the information before they have the conversion. Yeah. Yeah. I was converted, and then I started learning about the Bible. Like, I had never heard of Samson, you know what I mean? I had never heard of Jonah. Like, so... I knew what it was like reading those stories for the first time, not knowing what the ending was, you know, and letting yeah. the Holy Spirit speak to me about those things. Like, but they knew all the stories. Church kids know all the information. They know standards before they give a flip about them. I learned the standard because I was excited to get, in, you know, get into the flow. Like, man, I want anointing. I want destiny. If that means cutting out certain worldly things, dude, I am so in love with this vision and I want to fulfill God's plan for my life so badly. Whatever movies instead of whatever, dude, I would love to have more of God if that means cutting out the movies. And matter of fact, I actually cut movies out of my life. This is totally random, but um, I was in the assembly of God. My grandparents, good church folks, they let me go to movies, but I remember being saved going with a girlfriend to a movie and hearing all the cussing. And I was like, they said GD so many times. I was like, I got offended. I got like ticked off for Jesus. Like, dude, watch your mouth, you little punk. You know, like I was just angry. Yeah. 
and I walked out and then the girl tried to kiss me goodbye. And that was like my first, my big moment, you know, you know, I'm not going to let her kiss me. I was like, so a lot of stuff happened that one night. I've never said this publicly. Sorry, Geneva, but like, you know, <laughs> and I was there, I was like, I'm not putting myself in this position anymore. Cause I thought I could go on a date and be clean. like, no, I don't, I'm not. And then I don't want to watch movies that offended me that, that agitated my spirit. You know, God's not glorified by this. So then when I got to the fellowship and they're like, yeah, you know, there's some standards that are going to help us be filled more with God. And the Bible says in first John two, 14 and 15, if the love of the world is in you, then the love of the father is not in you. I understood what that meant. Not it. And again, it's not like I got that information. And then later on, I decided to serve God. I wanted to serve God. Then I heard that scripture and I was like, that makes sense. And you only have so much real estate in your heart. You only have so much time in a day. Yeah. So everything you're pouring out for the world or pursuing the world means that you're not doing it for God. And so um, that was a little tangent, but. But it's uh, okay. It's okay. <laughs> hey, some, somebody out there needs to hear that. Come on. Stop uh, going. <laughs> Somebody's on their way to the movies right now. With uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, or they're clicking on Netflix. So. Yeah, that's the new movie. <laughs> yeah. Delete it, yo. <laughs> Pastor, r- yes. real quick, on this subject while we're here, um, is there any advice that you can give or would want to give parents uh, about raising their kids in the will of God? What's the balance? What What yeah. are key things that maybe you picked up that, that, that can help some parents yeah. out there? Well, the obvious one is you got to walk the walk, you know parents who are living double lives it's they're sabotaging any anything else that they're trying to accomplish so but one of the first things i would say is that um standards are not wrong and standards are outflow of convictions so parents need to guard their conviction you know and uh for church kids you got to build convictions also you know, there's a reason why we do certain things. Find out the why and then fight for it. I, I honestly believe that God's going to raise up a group of young people from converts and from church kids and even from backslidden church kids who come back and say it's not what they promised in the world. It's all a lie. And they're going to come back. And I believe there's going to be a group of young, young folks who want to serve God and they're not going to push back and try to lower the standard. They're going to say, we're going to embrace the standard and we're going to take it to the next level because we're going to be more radical. We're going to be more powerful. We're going to be more bold. We're going to reach more nations. I mean, we're going to have to start reaching some closed nations. Yeah. You know, and we're going to need some radical. And I think God's going to raise them up. But for the parents, guard your convictions. And I don't know if I get in trouble for saying this, but parents... You're allowed to tell your daughter, if she's going to walk out of the house looking like a hoochie, <laughs> like we got saved out of the clubs, you know, it's like you can, you are allowed to tell your kid, you're not leaving my house dressed like that. And then when they ask you why, then you break down why modest is still hottest. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and so you will have to explain some of the whys, you, you know, they're, My wife has a passion for modesty. You know what I mean? So if you ask her and many other girls like, hey, why do you dress a certain way? Why do you use an undershirt? Why do you not do this? It's like, man, they're passionate because purity can be stylish. Purity is all of this. So the parents um, have convictions, guard them, but also with grace. And so the grace has to come in because we know the... Uh, comparison you have a drug addicted person come in homeless person come in yeah and when we see them get saved we have a file in our mind that they're going to be on a path it's not going to be an easy path but we see that they can turn into something powerful and we understand there's going to have to be some love and grace you know and when they mess up we're like okay keep on fighting keep on trying but then then you have the church kids and there's a certain expectation. Yeah. I know we had talked about before that um, you you see like a sinner raise their hand during altar call. 
and the church gets really excited, the pastor gets really excited. But if the church kid raises their hand and all to call, there's kind of like this stigma, like, oh, what sin are they in? Or yeah, so yeah, what they do this time? Yeah. yeah. So that same grace, that same patience, that same understanding of the long game has to be applied. So in other words, we have convictions in this house. We have standards. We're not ashamed of that. We're not, you know, embarrassed about that. But there's grace. Number one, we want you to not just do it, but we want you to understand why. And then number two, if there are missteps or if there's problems, there's going to be grace. Yeah. The other thing, it would be to be intentional. To be intentional. You know, we did the thing in our car, no phones in the car. And that was our time to talk. And my kids laugh. They laugh to this day because I'll still ask them, what was your main takeaway from the sermon? I mean, you know, and it sounds cheesy, you know, it's a dad thing, but it was for conversation. Yeah. yeah. You know, the phrase in our house, what's going on in your world? Again, they know what that means. It's, I'm not, it's not like this super creative way of interacting. And, you know, I'll give away one of my secrets. Oh, I'm ready for you this. Ready for this? I hope you are recording. I don't know how to talk to a 15-year-old girl. Like, how do you talk to your daughter? I Googled conversation starters for your teenage daughter. <laughs> what came out? A bunch of cheesy, dumb stuff. But a couple ideas that triggered to try to get her to talk. Try to let her know I care. And so it, it, was, it was. But it was all intentional. It was just being intentional. Yeah. Like, I just want to be involved. I just want to know where you're at. And I really want you to know that you can talk to me. Yeah. So that was it. And then the, the, the best advice, we've always had a philosophy of work hard, play hard. Always had a philosophy of do what you can with what you got, where you're at, and you might as well make a party out of it. I mean, I'm sorry, fellowship. <laughs> <laughs> but making memories, you know, having fun. And that really became important when we went to India. And uh, one of the best advices I got was from Pastor John McCarthy. He said, have fun with your family. Let them enjoy it. So in India, we had to leave every six months uh, for visa purposes. And I just, I personally didn't feel super comfortable just letting that be vacation time. So I was like, hey, told my family. And again, this is being intentional. I'm bringing them along with me. I'm not just telling them, hey, this is what's going to happen. I brought them along and I said, hey, we're going to minister in Sri Lanka. You know, they did special music. I preached. We're going to go serve the church. We're going to go work, but we're going to have a good time. So sure enough, they got to ride an elephant. You know what I mean? It's like, so we made memories. We had a good time, but we also poured our lives out. We went to the Malaysia rally. We took some of our uh, folks from India there. It was a lot of work, you know, but then they had fun as well. So, you know, you're accommodating people the first time out of a, their home country and then you got to keep tabs and that's very, very, you're doing double work. <laughs> yes, yes. But we're also going to go to the Patronus Towers and we're going to take pictures and we're going to let you make friends with your other missionary, uh, you know, peers and stuff like that. So um, convictions with grace, being intentional and uh, making memories, you know. So that's kind of our approach to raising them up. No, oh, yeah, I think that's, that's, I like that because it's not out of anybody's reach. Those are things that you can start now, anywhere you're at, in any walk of life, in any level or capacity of ministry, you can do that with your kids. Yeah. And you know, that's what they need. That's huge. They need. Perfect. Yeah. Um, Pash, I just really would like to take this moment here. We're talking about what. God is going to do, I really do believe, I, I, I agree with you, that God is going to bring this revival out of the youth. Uh, the last days, God's yeah. presence, God's spirit will be poured out upon our flesh. Yes. And uh, I really believe that. But in our fellowship, uh, as you know, you've been around for a while, uh, many of my personal peers, uh, like 80%, are all backslidden. Right, pastors' kids, church kids that grow up in church, yeah, uh, tend as as for some reason or other tend to backslide more than just newcomers that come in. Right, 
uh, if you could speak to them, if we had this time right now, what, what would you be able to tell a backslidden church kid? Yeah. Yeah, to a backslidden church kid, I would, I would say the sinner's prayer is still valid. I, one of the struggles possibly could be, I've prayed this a million times. You know, God, sometimes people leave, they, they say that they are pushing back on standards or you made me come to church or, you know, I, there's certain things about the Bible I don't understand. The wise youth pastor told the uh, freshman uh, in college who came back and wouldn't come to church and he went to visit him and said, hey, son, you know, you're back for the summer. You haven't come to church. Yeah, there's some things about the Bible that I just uh, have questions about. And the youth pastor said, what's her name? <laughs> So the issue sometimes is not the issue. So there could be guilt. There could be shame. There could be this thought that I've tried and it doesn't work for me. Now, they don't want to say it in that way, you know, um, because pursuing the flesh does give some temporary satisfaction. So they're holding on to that while in the background of their heart, they're like, hey, you know, I tried and this didn't work. The sinner's prayer is still valid to any backslide any backslider, any backslidden church kid, you can get on your knees and you can say, Jesus, I, I am a sinner. I take responsibility for my bad decision. Yeah. Your parents might have been too hard. Your parents might have been, had some hypocritical areas of their life. But let's just, let's just get raw. That's not the issue. You take personal responsibility. Yeah. That's part of the sinner's prayer, saying, I am the biggest part of the problem. And Jesus, I believe you died on the cross and rose from the dead. And I confess you as my Lord and Savior. That sinner's prayer can meet you wherever you're at. The prodigal son said, I've sinned against heaven. I've sinned against my family, sinned against my church. I will arise and I will return. And so that path is still open. And the other thing I would say to a backslidden church kid is, not only do we have a place for you, in our church, but God has a plan for you. And, you know, don't just come back with an attitude or like anybody owes you anything. You, you probably need a little deeper repentance if that's your vibe. But like, if you really want to get right with God, he will, he will reveal himself to you. Yeah. He will fill you with his Holy Spirit. You can know power from heaven in a personal experience. And Let's get to work. Let's be radical, man. Yeah. Let's like backslider, come home and let's do this. Like let's roll. Yeah. Let's do something crazy for God. You know, there are nations waiting. There's, you know, there are some backslidden church kids. God wants to bring you back and just prosper you. Get all of that nonsense out of your life. All of the stupidity, all of the worldliness, all the deception. Come back. We got a place for you and let God bless you. Like, yeah. Just let it flow, man. Let it happen. And so that's, that's my message. Come home. Let's do, let's do it right now. Jesus, I'm a sinner. I repent. I'm coming home. Fill me with your Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Backslider, we got now. I'm saving you a seat. There you go. You're right. listening to this right now. Wherever you're at, I will make sure you have a seat. Let's do it. That's good. <laughs> <laughs> we got a post pastor's number at the end. Here. You said I had a... Yeah, that's awesome. No, that's I really feel it uh, in my spirit and I could just be me, uh, but I've been praying a lot. Just, just where our fellowship's at, the age it's at, the things we've seen, the people that have come and gone. And I feel I really do feel that in these last these last days, maybe these coming years, we're going to see a lot of returning backsliders. Yeah. Church kids that left and they're going to come back. And they are going to be radical yeah. because they went and saw that it wasn't. Yeah, good. I believe it. And, and I meant everything I said, but we also know that it might not be easy. There might be some apologies. There might be a path. Yeah. But anything worthwhile in life is going to come at a price. So that humility might not be easy. I'm not saying it's going to, you know be without conflict or agitation or a conversation that you don't want to have. Yeah. But let's do it. Let's do it. There's so, so much that God has, you know. Oh, 
that's perfect. Yeah. So what would you say, Pastor, what advice can you give a teenager that's listening to this, that's in a church somewhere in our fellowship or, mm-hmm. or even any church, you're a teenager, they're saved, they love God. Yeah. How can they stay saved in this generation? Yeah. Uh, that's, that's a beautiful question because it's God's full intention to bring you through. Yeah. Paul said, I am convinced. I am thousand percent persuaded of this one thing. He who began a good work in you will complete it to the day of Jesus Christ. That word complete in the Greek means everything necessary accomplished to bring to fruition or completion. So God is willing to do everything necessary to keep you part of his family. So that's, first of all, is a biblical conviction. Uh, 1 John 5, 13. I am writing these things to you who believe on the name of Jesus, that you may be assured, convinced. You may know beyond a shadow of a doubt that you have eternal life and that you may continue to believe. So a biblical conviction and assurance that your salvation is from Christ, that it's his intention to keep you. Like, delete from your brain that God's waiting to find you messing up so he can kick you out. Delete that. Just do not spend a single iota of energy considering that God's just waiting to get rid of you. That's foolishness. He saved you to keep you saved. So that biblical conviction, and then be radical. That's my advice to a church kid. Be radical. And that would take some time maybe to define what being radical means because some people have a picture of radical, you know, that doesn't yeah. fit their personality or fit their calling or fit their skill set. I believe everybody should street preach. I believe everybody should be a witness. So to a church kid, to somebody in a church that's young, uh, define being radical for yourself. Okay, 613 laws that Moses gave. And a church kid went to Jesus. They called him a scribe. In other words, he had been raised in church. When he was 12 years old, he had been accepted to not go be a fisherman, not go be a carpenter, but he got accepted into the rabbinical school. So this scribe spent his life studying the word of God. That is the church kid right there. And he went to Jesus and he said, I know the 613 laws. I know what to do to keep my parents off my back. I know what to do to make my pastor think I'm on on board. But Jesus, I'm just tired of all the conflict inside. Like, can you break it down to me? What is the most important? Like, Jesus, can you tell me what, like, if I really want to be connected with my father, even if I'm messing up on some of these 613 laws that Moses dropped on us? And Jesus said, yeah, that's easy. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your soul, with all your strength. And learn how to treat people right. Learn how to have good relationships, you know. But that's Jesus. He's saying, you want to make it? Be radical, man. Be sold out. Yeah. Oh, perfect. <laughs> that's good. That's very, good. very, very good. Yeah. All right. Well, here's the last and final deep question. What would you tell the younger Pastor Wacker, when, whether he was in the Assemblies of God in Colorado or moving down to yeah. Austin, being 17, all by himself, just him and his sister? What advice would you give? Man, that, that's a good one. Because I would love to have a conversation with that dude. Like, I would love to have a long conversation. But, you know, for the sake of the answer, I would look that young man in the eyes. One day I went to Pastor Parker. And um, we had been bringing, Pastor Parker and I actually were chopping it up. And we saw that we, my sister and I probably brought a few hundred people to church in a year's time like in different individuals we invited that we brought. And we were at a place where none of them were serving God at that point. It was still us as the only teenagers. And uh, I was weeping, man. I was just so frustrated. I was like, what am I doing wrong? And he said, Wacker, just just keep doing what you're doing. We're going to believe God. And I don't remember everything he said, but he gave me enough mojo to get to the next day and to bring the next person to church. And so I would look that young man in the eyes and say, it's worth it. Yeah, it's worth it. And and that's what I would say, because God has exceeded everything that I was desiring 
as a 17-year-old young disciple and all of the things that we had to go through, girls that I liked and my pastor was like, hey, I got a call from her pastor and, and uh, he said that she's probably not a healthy person to have in your life right now. I listened to my pastor and I didn't know at that time, but now I look back, she's divorced, she was an adulterer, she blew up her life, she was so calm. Like, I get to look back and say, I listened to my pastor and he saved my life, you know? So I would, I would say to 17-year-old Jeremiah, just keep doing what you're doing. It's worth it. It's not going to be easy. But Yeah, and I think anybody can take that away, that whether you're in the church and you feel alone or you're not in the church and you feel you're saved, you're just grinding out there, you can have the satisfaction that when you get older, it's going to be worth it, that you'll be able to look back yeah. and you'll be able to see in hindsight that all the decisions I made whether it be taking a stand against my parents, taking a stand in high school, um, going radical for God in my church, winning people over for God, that you can look back in hindsight and say, it was all worth it. And that I think that's a really big takeaway to have that. When you get older, you can yeah. have peace that it was worth it. It was all worth it. Yeah, that's huge. Yeah, man, I just uh, was asking uh, in another Texas city, I asked the pastor, where's this guy? In 1996, me and that dude ran an outreach together. I said, hey, where is he? And he was a disciple. He was young, uh, married. And um, he's like, man, that guy's on his second marriage. He's had two kids commit suicide. He's addicted to drugs. And he said he just sent me Venmo for his tithe. It was $4.20. God. So it's like, it's almost like I could tell young Jeremiah that story. Hey, bro, there's two paths you can take here. Because me and that dude were like standing next to each other, outreaching, having Whataburger, saying that we we're going to reach the world for Christ. And uh, yeah, so <laughs> um, I'm glad, you know, I didn't do a lot of things right, but I did do this right. I kept my heart right. Yeah. And we serve God no matter what. No, oh, awesome. Yeah, that's uh people like you that give us hope of you know what it is to stick it out. Uh yeah. fight through some battles, small church, you know. Uh you know, everything that you've gone through, even stuff we don't know about in your personal life, your your mind, your family, your heart, your kids, you know, things mm -hmm. in your home, but out here we see you know, evangelist Jeremiah Wack is still preaching, still has a good heart. And that's what we look at. And, and some people can see that as a unattainable. Mm -hmm. Oh, he lives a special life or God has, he's, mm -hmm. he's one of God's favorites where nothing goes wrong for him, you know? But in reality, uh, as I get older and I meet leaders in our fellowship, I'm like, wow, they go through stuff too. You know, like <laughs> yeah. it's not just us grinding it out. It's not just us that loses our job. You know, it's not just us that, you know, goes, go, go through things, but yeah. It's keeping your heart right and it's worth it. Yeah. That's that's what I keep hearing over and over with with, with people like and you just said to yourself, it's worth it. It's worth it. So if you're listening out there, mm. you're going through stuff, you're making decisions, you don't know what your future is gonna look like. Just know serving God is worth it. Nothing else out there. That's it. That's huge. And it's attainable, man. I have no doubt that my kids I man. They are going to far exceed anything that I've accomplished. And it's not just in ministry, you know, because some of our kids will be called, some of them will be pillars, you know. Uh, but, yeah, it's very attainable. If I can do it, anybody can do it for sure. Yeah. Awesome. Anything else you'd like to add, Pastor, before we go? Man, no. It's my, my theme scripture. I'll drop that. Is, uh, drop it. Drop it. Because it is gin lit, right? Yeah. All gin. right. Here you go. Acts 3.19. Repent. Be converted. So your sins can be blotted out. And times of refreshing will come from the presence of the Lord. And so repent. Be converted. Your sins will be blotted out. And God is going to light up this generation. His presence. Yes, sir. Come on. I love it. <laughs> this has been a podcast where Jen lit, and we encourage you to subscribe, share it, 
turn on your notification bell. We want to be notified as soon as we drop. Uh, we would like you to comment on what you thought. Uh, leave any suggestions, topics, things you would like. And if you want to share, if any of this is, is resonating with any of you, we would like to hear about it. We want to know that we're reaching people, that this is our goal is, is to reach people. So if you feel that it's touched you in any way, leave a comment. Uh, you can even make it anonymous if you want, uh, but let us know. Subscribe and we'll see y'all next time.